and we will get started. Thank you all so much for joining us. I know that there might be some people here who are unfamiliar with the community practice, uh, but this is the monthly webinar series that the Campus is a Living Lab Community of Practice holds. And today we are, are very pleased to be joined by Demi Chopis, who is the Grounds and Garden Supervisor at Queen Mary University of London. He's worked there since January, 2020, and he studied horticulture science and graduated as a horticulture engineer. He has over 17 years of experience uh, in garden design, um, soft and hard landscaping, maintenance and consultancy, and recently undertook a course in social and therapeutic uh, horticulture. Uh, Demi is passionate about the environment, education, and mental health awareness, believing strongly that these are strongly related and each have an impact on the other. So today Demi is here to talk to us about growing regenerative horticultural practices into a campus as a living lab uh, experience. So with that, uh, Demi, please feel free to take it away. Right, uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Demi, uh, thank you for your time. And let me start with my slideshow. So uh, yes, welcome. First of all, I would like to talk a bit about myself, uh, my connection to horticulture and the relationship with nature, because it does go back to a long way. I have grown up in the countryside. Uh, we were pretty much self-sufficient, what you would call nowadays. We grow on all vegetables, raised all our livestock. And what it meant that we were pretty much organic in many sense. One of my first, uh, earliest memories are going in the polit or in our politana where we were growing a wide range of vegetables. Uh, also, we did our own wine, grow grape and turn it into wine. So that's very has a very significant effect on my life and the way how I look at uh, nature. Later on, we moved to a town where eventually life was slightly different. And then uh, finishing my secondary education, uh, or we call it high school, I went to study horticulture sciences. Um, I learned quite a bit about anything and everything, psychology, physiology, and anything related to horticulture. Interestingly enough, there were a lot of practices and knowledge which I learned then, and it's changed, my view changed about them in the last few years. And the next few slides, I will explain why and how. So the next slide. Right, uh, I picked this quote because I think it is very important and, and, and very uh, essential, especially nowadays. We cannot solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we use when we created them. Uh, we have to change the way how we see things to be able to change it. Right, first of all, I would like to talk a bit about soil, as I'm sure many of you know, but maybe there will be certain things are, which are new to you. Uh, soil, it is essential and it's surrounding us. We use it to grow, we use it to raise, uh, build in many instances. And uh, some way it's actually, we are built up because what we consume is grows in the ground, ideally. I will explain why I think that way. And, and then became part of us. So there is a short description about soil. Uh, it is 45% sand, slit, and clay, which is the, which is the hard, hard part. There is 25% air, which I think is very important, and I will uh, explain it in the later slide. There is about 25% water and 5% organic matter, which made up about 50 to 80% humus, but 25% actively decomposing uh, parts uh, around 10% dead. And there is a small percentage, or it looks a small percentage, 5% living organism. But as you see at the bottom of the slide, the uh, teaspoon of soil can contain upwards 50 billion microbes and microorganisms, which I think I can say that we are still learning every day something new about and their importance and how they relate to plants, how they relate to us. So I think that's a huge number considering in a small portion. So on this slide, I think it's very much and very well represent the effect of soil erosion and uh, also they call it desertification. As you see this quotation on the top from the United Nations, uh, according to their report, we got about another 60 years where before uh, all lands on earth became inhabitable. 
I think this worry is very much real and it's very much uh, linked to climate change and the fact of how we practice and how we grow and how we uh, raise animals and how we do anything pretty much around us. Because with the insensitivity as we use the soil, uh, there is this danger of uh, soil movement, desertification, the breakdown of the soil. And eventually with the soil breaking down, its water holding capacity uh, reduce, uh, permeability is reducing, also very much affect how fertilizer and other chemicals get washed off, get into water courses and through pretty much into our body. So it's very important to look at the health of the soil and trying to improve it, which became very important and frequent in the present, if I may say. So the next picture is really uh, a bit of a compression between what you would, or I would call traditional uh, agricultural or horticultural practices and the bit between the regenerative way of doing. <clears throat> So in traditional practices, there is a, a significant period in, during the year when the soil is bare. What I mean is when nothing is growing on, eventually this day, people would call it as a resting period. But unfortunately, this is the period when the most carbon dioxide would leave the soil. So it's just to understand a bit, plants take a sequest carbon dioxide from the air, uh, and this is how the way how it can get into the ground, where it's turned into sugar and the oxygen part as well. There is so, and also a lot of other things, but just to make it simple to understand. So bare soil pretty much uh, lose carbon dioxide. And from there, it's getting into the atmosphere. And that has a detrimental and significant effect on our climate change. Also bare soil, uh, doesn't protect, so there is no protection on the soil. Uh, the temperature of the bare soil is much higher opposed to the one when there is something growing. That's again, it's proven a number of times. Uh, we have on the other side, the regenerative way where we get crops all year around. Uh, some of the crops are just growing there just to uh, help with carbon sequestration. Also, it led to dying and this way it's fertilized the ground. And also there is this way of growing a lot of different things which can be harvested many different times. And it does also have with financial side of uh, farming. Also on the regenerative side, you can see there is carbon dioxide which leave the ground, but there is much bigger proportion which actually gets sequestered and get back to the ground. And in this way, we can actually reduce uh, the climate change, the, the glass house effects, if I may say. So the next slide, uh, the next uh, part is the tilling. So the way how we do it. So traditionally, uh, grounds is used, they are used big machinery. Unfortunately, this way, the, the soil structure get broken. And the, when it get broken, uh, it lose, again, it lose its water holding capacity, therefore, doesn't matter how much we water, the water runoff cannot hold it, doesn't get to the ground, doesn't get into the ground where it's actually essential. It does affect the underground water courses. Opposed to the regenerative way when there is no till or there is this other becoming uh, quite popular nodic technique. So the nodic technique is where you pile a huge amount of organic material on the top of the surface and just you let it to uh, rot down and you actually plant into that material. No tilling, it would mean that the, there is machineries which are, I would say, invented or by use now uh, many uh, regenerative farming uh, practices where the ground gets just slid uh, after the, the sucklings or the seedlings or seeds get uh, placed into the hole and straight away get closed. Uh, the next bit is about chemicals. Again, it does affect, we use a huge amount of chemicals worldwide. Uh, again, this, the, 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 the statistics are proving it. And I would say that it's quite strange to think in a way of that we have to use chemicals to kill 
to be able to grow something, which in my way is quite controversial. Also, these chemicals do affect uh, the microbes and microorganisms in the ground. By reducing and killing them, we do affect uh, how much we can grow and how healthy is these plants are. Also, by using chemicals, the plant's uh, natural immune system gets suppressed or in many cases simply just disappear. Moreover, what is very important, by using chemicals, as I said, if it cannot go into the ground and washing down, it can, it, it can get into our water courses and through that, it's into our body. Opposite in the regenerative way, there is a reduced or more uh, organic chemicals, which are like oil-based, uh, for instance, neem oil. Uh, this is where how we try to control uh, any pest and disease. And finally, I would like to mention about fertilizer, which again, very important because it's pretty much become a catch-21 uh, circle by we using fertilizer to increase the yield. And we have increased yield, which take up more uh, nutrition from the ground. Therefore, we have to use even more to be able to do the next year or the next cycle. In regenerative practices, we would use organic fertilizers, uh, manures, uh, mulches, wood chippings, uh, just anything to trying to build up back the soil. The next slide is about a bit of the farming and it's just compression. There is quite a few different regenerative uh, farming technique. Uh, here I just picked the intensive or you would call it traditional farming opposed to the holistic grazing. So the intensive farming, as it says, uh, pretty much uh, animals kept in confined overcrowded condition where uh, usually very limited outdoor access. And I think what is very important is that nowadays antibiotics I use uh, with preventative way rather than using it as it needed. And I did work one time uh, at a farm where we're building a storage yard, uh, barn and I did see how much uh, antibiotics they use into animals. And when you think about it, by using them and you consume it, it's getting to your body as well. So I'm not so sure that's the way forward personally. So in holistic grazing, the, the, the grazing is uh, like the plant matters. Uh, so the way how it's uh, structured and timed is all look what's the best for the, the plants. So the plants, the ground has enough time to recover, regenerate before the next cycle. So as you can see from the small uh, graph, uh, animals are continuously moved around, but it is, it, it, it is very precise. And therefore it's good for the animal, good for the ground. It's much better and it's more profit as well. The next slide is about uh, deforestation, which again is something very uh, significant. As you can see how many millions of hectares uh, of trees are uh, and land get deforested. Once again, by reducing the amount of trees, we are reducing the, num the amount of carbon can be sequestered uh, through their uh, photosynthesis. Therefore, there is more carbon in the uh, atmosphere, which again, unfortunately, has a detrimental effect on climate change. Also, by reducing uh, the trees, the flood risks are much higher. And that's again, it's proven. I can uh, say it because uh, a couple of years ago, actually it was in 2020 spring, we had huge floods in the UK where it's, it, it took over and, and you can see on pictures where there was the flood that the trees are pretty much diminished. So nothing slowed down the water, nothing could uh, take up that amount of water. And also uh, there is a lot of scientific evidence that plants are communicating with each other, underground communication, networking. And by taking all, all these trees out, uh, we reduce this. What is very important to mention, the fact that how trees are planted and nowadays became unfortunate that uh, they are planting trees which are growing very quickly so they can turn into them wood and they can use them. Again, I think personally, I prefer using more native trees which last longer and has a longer and 
bigger benefits for our environment and for long-term effects. So the next picture is a bit of a both uh, amenity and historical landscape, and I'm just going to explain. So in terms of amenity landscape, like sport fields or private gardens, in my view, uh, they are overworked. I know there is this uh, balance, especially in sports fields, how much you have to look after, but there is a lot of different way, more, more sustainable, regenerative way, how we look after them and uh, you know, continuously aerating is something which we can improve their uh, water permeability and holding capacity. Also using less synthetic fertilizer, using more organic fertilizer. So there is a lot can be done to support uh, the, the soil health and the building back the soil. And the bottom part, uh, there is a private garden where I would imagine that can be even done more. A uh, certain section could be turned into wildflower meadows and you will see it on another slides and I will explain it. Also the fact that you don't always need to cut the grass very short, which is very common here in the UK, I have to say, and also uh, striping the lawn, which again, make it even more compact. Also, I would like to mention about historical landscapes. Uh, that picture is Chatsworth House, which very well known. It's get hundreds of thousands of visitors, which has an effect on its land. Also, the fact that the grass has to be cut all the time because of the visitors. I think in my view, there is a valid argument about what's the future of these places. Because if you want to regenerate, rewild or increase its biodiversity, there are certain aspects which have to be looked differently. And I think it's very much have to be started now. On the bottom of the slides, on the bottom two picture, one of them is Regent's Park. Again, it's very well known in this uh, Northwest London, where you can see that there is this so-called carpet bedding. Uh, again, it's beautiful without doubt, but put a huge strain on the ground and the way how uh, it's ha the ground needs to be managed to be able to plant all these uh, bedding plants. I think, again, there is a valid argument about how we go forward and how we try to reduce the stress. The next slide, I think something very important is this about urban and community gardens, which became very popular, especially during uh, the pandemic. Uh, I can say here in the UK, people started gardening way more than ever before because they couldn't go anywhere. So they just went in their gardens. And also there is these urban places where the, the green areas are reduced. So any small pockets where it can be turned into uh, green or just grow something, it's very beneficial. Uh, roof gardens are very popular in London. I actually looked after quite a few of them myself. Also these community allotments where people actually can socialize, they can reconnect with nature. Also, it's a very important educational place where people can grow their own vegetables, perhaps organically. Then they can make a difference between mass produced vegetables, fruits, opposed to the one which is organic. And it's something uh, we are doing at, uh, at the university where I work as well. So these places are very important. So the next few slides is about what we are doing and how we, we try to pull all these efforts together to create a campuses lab, which hopefully will happen one day. Uh, so the first slide is about this white flower meadow, which we started creating uh, end of last year. It's about 250 square meter. What we've done, we, we replaced uh, the existing lawn, ornamental lawn with white flower turf which contain 10 different species. And in addition, we planted about 3000 uh, flower bulbs uh, beneath the white flower turf, which came up as you can see on the picture, which was very much a number of daffodils, crocuses, uh, fritillarias, and, and it's very nicely uh, growing and, and developing, which I think is very important. By doing this, uh, be increasing the biodiversity. I have to say that there is, uh, it was difficult, there were difficulties because it's heavy work to create and also to make people understand that they have to look at the bigger picture and believing that something which we've done 
four months down the line. It, it will be something beautiful in four months down the line, but it pays off. Uh, we get a lot of uh, positive comments about, and also hopefully it can be part of uh, some research project. Uh, one of the academics mentioned the fact to to try to see how much carbon can be sequestered or using different fertilizers, see how the ground uh, co-fit it or how it's changing. So there is a lot of potential around and again, biodiversity, which I think is very important. So our next slide is about our community uh, orchard and soft food garden. So this this idea came came to me one day. I was was walking across our campus, which uh, has a residential side, a students' village, and I was thinking about how this place could be uh, utilized. And uh, because I specialize for food producing plants at my last year at uni, uh, it became very obvious that what if we plant some fruit trees so this is what we did uh, back in last september again i have to say it was hard work a lot of preparation we didn't know what to what what's going what will be in the ground so we had to prepare for all possibilities and had to order in uh, tons of topsoils just to ensure that when planting comes we have the right uh, right material we organized it with the students uh, we invited students to help us and 20 students turned up, uh, which, were, which was really good because this was just one day before the uh, autumn breakup time. And we managed to plant all these 60 uh, fruit trees, 30 apple, 30 uh, pear. And as you can see, uh, some of them, some of the pear trees are already in flower, which I have to say is very early, but uh, it's really good to see that uh, actually is working. Again, these trees uh, has a lot of potential. I'm planning to do workshops on pruning, also a number of uh, uh, harvesting, number of uh, scientific uh, research programs can be set, are, uh, set up around them on cross-pollination and uh, so on and so forth. In addition, we planted over a hundred raspberries and gooseberries. Uh, created a soft food garden. Eventually, these will take much longer before you actually see a real effect. But again, I'm very optimistic about and the fact how we can increase biodiversity, educate, uh, because believe it or not, one student actually asked me about the, is it the raspberry which after produce the fruit, what you pick from the shelf? So it, I was very happy about the fact that they were interested and we, and because most students studied from home and from their room during lockdown, that was actually real, a real opportunity them to socialize again and actually meet in real life. So this again is something, it will take time, but has a lot of potential. So the next uh, slide is about our other project, which we started a couple of months ago, is our community allotment. So on the top left uh, side, you can see our green area allotment, which was built, which which was built uh, five years ago. It's a more structured, very well done area. Uh, the way how it works, people can sign up for a plot and they can have it for a year and after they can uh, re-sign re up again if they want or somebody else can use it. In the bottom section is the other bit which we, we were just built using uh, recycled pellets. And the reason I wanted this, this is right in the middle of the student's village. Uh, the view how I looked at it is that the allotment area is really good, but it felt a bit secluded, uh, especially with the two and a half meter tall fence around, high fence around them. So I thought it's something maybe bring students closer to nature. And, and if they are closer to it and they can just walk up and they just look at it, they can touch the plants. And this is this is what actually we started working on it. Uh, we started growing our plants from seed. Everything you can see on the picture is what has been grown from seed since January. Uh, we are we were really lucky that the weather was really mild. So we have over a thousand uh, lettuces, rocket seedlings, uh, countless tomatoes, uh, so on and so forth. So it, it, it is really good. We are looking ahead a really good year. And again, we are doing a number of activities with students 
and uh, workshops. Students can come uh, independently as well. They can approach me and then they can come and do some work with us. Uh, on the downside, I would say that there is uh, challenges we face because it is in the student's village. Students like to play football. They like to party. So there is, there is this part of it. But again, I think all the benefits outweigh the negative parts. And what I'm hoping is to achieve by engaging with students and bringing them on board is that actually they start looking after and they have this responsibility or this feel of reminding each other to not destroy something which was solely built for them and also for staff as well uh, who want to engage it. So all these uh, projects, I would think and I would believe that these part of or can form part of uh, campuses a lot uh, eventually and once bring to once they are brought together we can we can actually do something bigger and be more organized so the next slide is about i would like to ask your opinion because uh, i've been talking about what we are doing but still you know what's your view on it and what would you think how can we manage it maintain it a better way or what you think should be taken into account or how to advertise or communicate. We are in the beginning of the road. So I would very much welcome any opinion or advice from anybody. Thank you so much. I am typing up these questions so we can put them in the chat. Uh, and as soon as I have them in the chat, then I think we can open up discussion on this. Okay. But wonderful presentation. I'm really excited to hear what the rest of the community uh, has to say on these great questions. Right. Uh, so, and that's finally, that's, 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 that's the end of it. Uh, so I would like if you can discuss about, or if anybody has any opinion. Hi, hi Dimi. I just, before we yes. get into the discussion, I, I had a question about your yes. uh, wildflower uh, meadow. Yes. Could you tell us a bit more about you mentioned was it a wildflower turf almost that you installed? Like how did you go about to, did you have to tear out the existing turf? What what, what are some of the mechanics of how you um, brought that to life? And then I guess subsequent to that, was there um, an incentive to do this from a, a pollinator perspective? Um, what what drove you to make the shift to wildflowers? So yes. Uh so all, all I, I think I could say all of them all together. So the, the turf, there is, there is a number of different ways how you can create a white flower meadows. You can use seeds, you can use plugs, or we choose the option of turf because that's something has a much more in, uh, instant effect. And I think I personally found it is more reliable than using the other techniques. Uh, yes, we, we want to use uh, engage more pollinators in, increase the biodiversity and uh, reduce the amount of uh, work we do, maintenance. So it cut down significantly on our maintenance. Therefore, we use less uh, fuel. I mean, we're already using battery power tools, but I think it, it's much better to reducing it. And also the aim is this is just 250 square meter. We have about 5,000 square meter of a greenery so we will aim to do at least 70 percent of turn 70 percent of all the loans for first instance and then extend it to other campuses as well and and uh, you mentioned it briefly but what has been the response to the wildflower meadows i know we've been um the small area of our campus that we've converted to native grasses and they're, they're quite tall so yeah. What used to be an area where students would congregate um, during the few months that are snow free here. Yep. Um, you know, now we really don't want students to be sitting on those those grasses. So I'm curious what um, yes. what so the response I, was. So these areas, the first four areas are raised beds. So naturally they wouldn't sit on. I mean, there is a lot of seating area. So we are lucky with, with from this perspective, or fortunate, not lucky, fortunate from this perspective that we have a lot of uh, uh, benches around i think the way is to educate them and as we progress and they actually experience it how beautiful it is i'm hoping to build some sort of responsibility in them and then then just keep the balance there will be areas where they can sit but there is always part where they can sit down and the rest can be turned into white flower meadow 
So uh, so far, the response was really good. I do post um, regularly photos on on Instagram, and uh, I got really good feedback from them actually. And they always ask me very 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 actually. I'm taking the photos, so I'm just always guiding to them. Um, I think students like to learn. It's very interesting because for me, it's, it's, it came naturally. Where I grew up on the countryside, we have tall grasses and, and you would go white flower meadows. But in, a, in an urban setting, especially in London, where there's so much concrete around and so little green spaces, it, it, it became something very unique, if I may say. And we are hoping to engage with community as well and use the space as much as possible for, for, for all sorts of activities. All right. Any uh, responses? Any additional questions about the presentation or comments on the on the questions being put forward? I'm going to switch over to see participant view here. And um, wonderful. Joe's just uh, created a comment here. Okay. Claire has a question here. Is anyone familiar with research to compare the energy and carbon footprint of comparing a bed of perennials to a bed of annuals? And Claire, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to add anything else on. I'm happy for people to, to share their questions in the plenary. It's a, it's a question that I wondered about. We don't do a lot of annual planting here and I, and that was before uh, sustainability became such a focus. But I would love to have kind of documentation to, to figure out the energy inputs into replanting a, a bed, um, as was shown, say, full of petunias year after year, as opposed to putting it in in perennials and getting, you know, five to 10 years out of it before it requires renovation. And I don't, I don't know of any research where people have tried to make that as a carbon or sustainability uh, um, criteria to justify that approach to landscaping? So uh, if I may say, in my view, I think this is where it comes in uh, what I mentioned about these, for instance, these historical places where there is this maintenance practice, something has been done over a century and people like to do it the same way. And this is where it comes in what you just said. Yes, there are certain changes need to be done. And if there is somebody interested to do a research on, then it can be justified why it's done. And I'm hoping that with all the effort we do, if there is only just one person do a research for that, in matter of fact, I've been approached by one of the students who want to do a research or a, a dissertation on uh, living walls and what effects living walls has and how they contribute in, in uh, the temperature of buildings and how much they change. So if there is somebody picking up on it, I think there is a real, real, you know, real, real way of doing it. And, and things can be done and changed. And then it can be shared with other people. And then I, I think anything can be changed. Okay, other questions uh, from the group? Like I said, feel free to unmute yourself or, or take the question in. And chat, Dini, I'll share with you a comment from Joe Fullerton, who had to leave. Um, he, he said, thanks for the presentation. They've been working, this is at San Mateo Community College in California, working on a GIS mapping effort of our campuses integrated with biology, so bees and pollinators, chemistry, looking at soil, biogeochemical cycles, and primary education, signage and communication for our preschool on campus. So they're working on an interdisciplinary cur curriculum prior to the pandemic. So um, I think Joe's making some headway on uh, looking at not only how to use the campus's lab, yeah. but how to weave together different disciplines. So um, you can always follow up with Joe. Uh, at, at some point, I can provide you with this contact information. Yes, I think uh, as I as we discussed or mentioned talked about it before, Rachel, the the, the fact that you know if different parts of different departments could work together much better, it can have a much more positive effect. Because with my work, I'm mainly on the maintenance and planning side, but I started working uh, with academics, which actually really good because they can learn more about our practices, uh, they can engage 
um, and certain things became, can become uh, the curriculum part. And this is what we are working. We applied for a, a grant where we can actually extend and uh, make faster or approaches on, on uh, rewilding and, and doing all these uh, works. Actually, uh, we, are, we will have a, a, roof, a green roof in the coming years where we are already planning to install sensors uh, prior to the work. So then it can be used and measured over the years which I think, again, something is, is a way of thinking differently and thinking ahead. And that's something uh, I think the, the, the key to working together. Okay, thanks, Damien. And Claire, Gina has posted a comment in the chat um, with an evaluation tool designed to provide generalized estimates of GHG impacts of conservation practices. So she was suggesting you might find uh, data on the emission saving yep. um, related to perennial plantings there. Thanks for that, Gina. Okay, any, anyone else using their campus landscape as a lab? Anyone else have, uh, have shared ideas or uh, challenges? Um, we could forward for Demi. We, I mean, at University of Calgary, we haven't done as much work on the landscape side of things from campus as a lab perspective. Most of our work has been done the co-curricular space where we have student groups taking on different projects so we do have um we call it edible garden although it's kind of a, a i think a bit of a misnomer because it's more like um uh fruit fruit shrubs and fruiting trees that um you know i think they were added on as a landscape feature to one of our lead buildings and um so their work really focused on generating awareness to the students that you could eat these plants and also or eat the fruit from the plants and the kind of the time of year to come and harvest them. And then some of the positive effects of harvesting the fruit. We have um, urban coyote populations in and around our campus and the fruit can be an attractant for them and, and cause the coyotes to get, come into conflict with people. So it's kind of all these different pieces, but most of the work we've done has been with uh, students generating awareness about our, our campus landscape and um, and its uses. Anyone else have uh, anecdotes to share? Yeah, at Florida State University, we have a student organic garden that really serves as a, a learning and hands-on teaching space for students. We have a similar model where students can rent garden beds for the semester or for the entire year, and in that way feel some more ownership towards the space. We also ran into the issue because our garden was right on the route of the tailgating uh, so it, in the United States, we have big football games where people will set up their trucks and tailgate and just have grills and stuff like that. And the garden was on the way there. And so um, people would often use the garden as a tailgating space or take produce from the garden on their way to tailgate. And so eventually we had to work with our landscaping and grounds to install a fence so that that was no longer um, so much of an issue. Um, I would say one thing that we're trying to that we're thinking about as we come back to campus is thinking about ways where we can use the garden space and have different tiers of engagement. So yes, researchers are always welcome to use the space for experiments, uh, pilot studies, things like that. But at a smaller level of engagement, our garden space is always available if a teacher just wants to take their students outside of the classroom one day and use the space as a little teaching area. Um, I've also heard uh, from other schools how in some, workshops that they have with faculty, um, for example, uh, workshops that are related to sustainability in the curriculum. One thing that they'll do to sort of break up the workshop day is bring people to the organic or um, pollinator garden and sort of do a campus sustainability walking tour where the garden spaces could be heavily featured. And that could be a really good way to just like let faculty know that those spaces exist and that they can use them uh, for research or for teaching. So those are a couple of the ideas that I've heard floating around related to gardens. Nathan, did you want to share anything? I see, I see your video unmuted. Well, I'm trying to get myself, so I just came in from the garden. Um, I'm trying to get set up here where the light's not terrible, but I, uh, I'm Nathan Pfeiffer, I'm sorry I was late. Um, I attend the campus garden at Wake Forest University. And um, it was actually my <laughs> inlet to uh, campus as lab. I started as a part-time garden keeper and um, 
we had a lot of success uh, introducing faculty to the garden space and incorporating sustainable agriculture into their kind of course themes. And so we've had um, a variety of first year seminars. It's a required course for our incoming students. Um, so we had a first year seminar on Thomas Jefferson where we kind of weaved in Jeffersonian uh, agrarianism into a campus garden tour. Um, our biology labs, our bio 101 for non-majors come out um, and we build compost piles, um, talk about the biology in the soil. Um, one of the things we always, ha always have growing in the garden is a cover crop, um, a leguminous cover crop, so I can pull it up and show students the rhizobia nodules. Um, at any rate, we've had a lot of success in the last four years. Um, actually, well, yeah, we've had a lot of success in the last four years, uh, especially pre-COVID, getting faculty members to come out to the garden. I think fall of 2019, we had 20 courses um, in the garden space, um, making some sort of sustainability connection. Um, since COVID, what's really taken off is volunteer hours. We have a team of 30 students who um, work in small groups of four to five to lead volunteer hours every day of the week, um, which is exhausting <laughs> for the garden keeper because you've got to find work. Um, our garden is about a third of an acre. It, it's, it's on marginal land. Um, it was, it's off technically, it's off campus. It's right across the street, um, which is really nice because we don't have a lot of the same aesthetic and budgetary pressures um, that having a garden like that on campus would be. And yet it's close enough for students, faculty and staff to walk. Um, it was actually started as a collaboration between a writing seminar and um, one of our biology faculty members, Gloria Mouday. She re researches anthocyanin in tomato plants. Anthocyanins, the uh, flavonoid that makes our fruits and vegetables purple and blue. Yep. Yeah. And so she's growing purple and blue uh, heirloom tomatoes. And she takes one of her biology sections out to a local middle school and high school and does um, you know, genetic education, Punnett squares, that kind of basic stuff. So we're doing it. We've struggled though on campus to use the landscape on campus <clears throat> as an educational tool. Um, you know, Wake's got a certain aesthetic um, and they're also very concerned about people just randomly eating food <laughs> that's yeah. growing on campus. And so those are some of the hurdles we face there. Nathan, can you speak to how you engage so many faculty members? I think that's something Demi was looking to, to yeah. uh, get some ideas around it. I mean, to have, I think you said 20 faculty members engaging in a year in your community garden. That's, that's phenomenal. Yeah, I'll have to do that. pull that up. <laughs> um, a lot of emails and phone calls and uh, when it was possible knocking on office doors. Um, that's really, um, I'm kind of known as the Tinder for sustainability in our office. Um, I'm supposed to be like the charismatic face of sustainability who goes and uh, gets to know all of um, the, all of our, you know, our big stakeholders on the staff side of things, um, those who are responsible for our energy systems, our water systems, our landscape, um, get to know them, build up some social capital. And then when I interact with a faculty member um, who might have, you know, an idea, I can help make those connections. Um, the other important thing that we do, uh, Laura Lynn referred to it, um, is our Magnolias curriculum project. Um, and that's, uh, Didi DeLongpre Johnston, our chief sustainability officer, launched that um, based on the, um, oh, out of Atlanta, Emory's, um, the original, uh, the, the name's escaping me right now, but um, we do our Magnolia's curriculum project, that, and um, every year there are faculty members there that I get to meet and interact with. We have a cohort, maybe 12 to 15 faculty members. Um, and I get about 30 minutes of FaceTime with them to tell them about the Campuses Lab program. Um, and really for us, it was presenting the campus garden as kind of a model of what Campuses Lab could be and saying, hey, we can do this with our energy, you know, we can do this with our LEED certified buildings. We can do this with our utilities operations center. We can do this with our landscape. And so um, the garden for, for Wake was kind of a launching point for campus as lab. 
there's no there's no substitute though to a conversation. It's really unfortunate, but also one of the joys of the work. Yes, I really relate to the the Tinder of sustainability. I always <laughs> think of myself as like the matchmaker between sustainability projects and sustainability faculty. Um, and one thing that I found too is you have to be really proactive with the faculty members. Like they will hardly ever come to me, but if I go to them, they're always really appreciative that I took the time and effort to, in the before times, meet them in their office or now just like set up a Zoom meeting. Yeah, that's... Uh... You can see my chicken scratch there. Um, every semester, I go through every course offering. So our fall course offerings are going to launch here April 15th or 17th, something like that. And so I'll reach out to uh, the registrar and get a searchable spreadsheet of all the classes being offered in the fall. And anything that I think hints of agriculture, gardening, or sustainability, I'll just go ahead and send kind of a form email to those faculty members. Yeah, that's a, that's a great yeah. idea. I love the analog uh, spreadsheet uh, date then that we've done it in our office. Um, it, kind of in a similar way, um, different a method of getting there. You know, we have some uh, co-op students who um, will go through and search, search all the classes that are being offered. And we particularly have been looking for higher enrollment courses because we're wanting to reach more students. Yeah, and, yeah sending out those cold emails. Um, to folks, I think is, is a really good thing to do. And if your institution submits to STARS, a lot of times you have to submit um, a sustainability course inventory. So you actually use that to start with and then yep. which, which courses are being offered. So kind of a way to leverage some of the, uh, the reporting work that you might be doing. Doing it every semester makes that three-year process so much easier. Yeah, <laughs> Having exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, thanks so much for sharing, Nathan. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank also. you, Nathan. All right, any, anyone else have a question or insight to share? Ideas for Demi as he heads down his campus's lab path. I'm trying to think. Um, the way in our, our campus garden, it's all student. We have a student club that runs the garden itself. So that's yeah another way of engaging students and empowering them you know we provide the support around working with risk and getting waivers signed and all those pieces but we've really given them the reins to do what they want um, to the landscape and, and within that space and um, this year they're doing something really neat a lot of the a lot of the beds were neglected last year because of covid um, it wasn't running at full capacity so a lot of them got weedy and um, these students are really interested in permaculture design and honoring um, indigenous ways of knowing and doing in, in our part of the world. And so they're taking half of the garden beds and turning it into a big permaculture installation. Mm -hmm. And um, they're, so they're looking to do lots of things uh, through yep. that. And I think there'll be a lot of research opportunities um, as well. We've also used the community garden as a space to promote um, uh, dialogue around pollinators and pursued a, a B campus designation focused in around our community garden. Although it's a, a small part of campus, it's a, I think a huge part of our campus's lab efforts around landscape. And, and Amy, I'm wondering if, if you want to go back to your slide around the, the questions. Yes. Uh, Put that on the screen. Just, just see it. Oh, yeah, yes. it might trigger some thoughts here for folks. Yes. So I think, well, I mean, in terms of just the first question, the first question, what do you think in, in you know positive and negative effects, or is there is there negative at all, or because there is always counter effects or, or effort, and and how it it's in my view, for instance, uh, the, one of the academics who approached and said that wants to set up this, this trial on, on using different fertilizer in different dose and see how it is affect. It's a, it's a, I'm sure it's a great, a great research, but in the same way, it does affect the soil and it does affect the ground. And so you, know, you, you have to do something not so good to, to get information and see how it can be turned into something positive. So I, I don't know if, what other people think about that. Is it, is it good? Is it worth it?
we're, we're really fortunate. We've got um, historic Renolda House uh, that's adjacent to campus and they have their own uh, garden, set of gardens. Um, and so we've had um, like engineering classes um, do sensory data taking from our greenhouse and the campus garden and their greenhouse down there. Um, but we've never done, they till more than we do. Um, and so if, if ever the opportunity arose, you know, having two different gardens like that um, for comparison's sake, um, I, I think it's kind of beneficial. I think looking for partner gardens too. In the communities, we have some um, community gardens in Winston-Salem that are um, located on top of, um, Oh, what's the term, a brownfield, uh, somewhere where there was waste in the topsoil, um, heavy metals, things like that. Um, and so, you know, finding those partners, I think, uh, is important if you're going to do that kind of, I'm thinking about positive and negative. Um, <laughs> find somewhere where it's a negative and see if you can help them fix it. No, that, that, that's something. Yeah, I agree. Agree. Is it's a uh, there is there is I think there is a lot of potential is, and I think what is would be very important to to networking with people and just find out how they do and and comparing, and then the different how things can be done in a different environment and how it does affect them. So, uh, in terms of management, I mean, does eventually the, the part if wherever is done if you turn it in, you have to manage it differently. Or what I learned so far from uh, other institutes that if the students look after for any research project, how, how you manage it, or you do, do you leave it as, as, as it goes wild? Or this would be something I would be very interested in to know from, from any of you uh, who are on the call and how they do it. Something I would share with this question, DB, is that uh, this is often a concern from our operations folks when we're talking about engaging students. It's that long term sustainability. What happens after that student graduates and there's no one there to care for it anymore? So I think it's it's an important thing to talk about during the planning stage and what's the um, what's the long term plan for managing that that asset, so to speak. Um, and then the other thing I would share in terms of management and maintenance, something we've seen, and I, I don't know if others would agree with this, but um, people who have on our campus been in charge of grounds, perhaps um, come from a different paradigm of ma grounds management where, yeah, it is all about green grass, keeping it cut short, um, using, um, not focusing in on, on native species, that kind of thing. and and. So bringing um, people along who perhaps have practiced landscape care in a, in a different way, um, I think can be an important part of the work and it, it's that relationship building and, and um, involving them in the research too. So, uh, we don't really have um, a horticulture program on our campus. So there have been some efforts made through our campus architect to partner with an adjacent community that has an agricultural college and bringing um, either graduates from that program to work for us, or even we're hoping to partner on some, some research projects. So those are a couple of thoughts um, I have to share, but happy to yeah. pass it on. No, thank you. Thank you, that's brilliant. No, 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 it's, it, it's good to know because that's, we, 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 we are just about to start and, and just to know how I can after look after or what to look after before even actually start this whole, this whole way of doing it. And eventually we have to bear in mind that the maintenance. So even if we, for instance, about to set up a new green walls uh, on, on our campus. But my concern always is about the maintenance, how we look after, and it's all good and it's great for, the, for, for doing research, but in the same time, it have to be presentable. And, and it's really finding the balance between to know what, what to do and how to, and, and what's the, the, the limits are and, and how does it affect the, the research program, what they would do whose responsibility to, to, to look after. So I think there is a, there is a lot of question around and uh, I'm hoping that the, the answers, whatever we get can be shared and, and you know, shared with other, with other people, other institutes and learn about. Uh, we will be the student or some of our second year uh, geology students are doing uh, field work tomorrow on our campus. And as part of it, I created a map for them 
where the green spaces are so they can do work. And I will be talking actually about campus as lab. So I'm trying to promote it in that way and hoping that there is, there is more interest than there is more need and there is a bigger push to actually to, to really start it and, and get uh, support behind uh, both uh, academic and finance as well, financial support from, from management. Yeah, on the management side, I'll add really quickly to um, our organic garden is managed by a, a sustainable campus uh, student staff member, so an undergraduate student who works 20 hours to maintain the garden. And we have an interesting arrangement where grounds and landscaping will mow around the garden beds, but then our, um, our student is responsible for weed whacking close to the garden beds. Uh, and then an, an additional piece of control that we have is an MOU agreement. So if anyone wants to use the garden space, um, we're very particular about who uses it, how they use it, making sure that they sign in writing, that they will pay for any damages to the garden that might occur. So another thing to keep in mind. That's, that's actually very interesting to know that some places do it that way as well, because as you just said, that it's all good to use everything, but what if something happens or going wrongly? And I think this is where that's one thing I've been thinking, and maybe somebody can give me answers in terms of signing. How 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 productive or how is it is it good or bad to put out signs and and trying to trying to highlight what actually happening there, or or, or is it worth it or doesn't worth it? Don't know what other people's uh, experiences are because we are just about to actually I'm having discussion with our resident our support team and and to creating banners. And I'm just hoping that it, do, it will work and it does highlight and then we have made the students understand what we are actually doing and they will look after much better. But what, what other people experience is it about? Yeah, we had interns work on that project. Um, they built kind of prototyped uh, podiums um, that we could attach laminated, I think it was like, 11 by 16 or, you know, post laminated yep. posters. At the end of the day, the tough thing is that you're outside, right? There, there's rain, there's sun, yep. um, that makes it really challenging. And so, you know, we've kicked around the idea of putting the posters out and taking them yep. down um, for certain specific groups that come. The original thought was we need some information out here so that when I'm not around or one of our three interns isn't around, yep. Um, that um, we can explain this is a rain garden here the class dug this hole measured the berm leveled the berm it holds rainwater this is why we want to yeah. stop and slow down rain water. Um, but we haven't <laughs> we don't have the money to figure yeah. out a more permanent solution to that signage um, signage that can is really durable it just would cost um, more money than we're willing to invest in it um, yeah, that, that was our take on that. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's very interesting what you just said, because again, signing, it has to fit in. So mm -hmm. it, it comes in and the more you think about, or more I was thinking about what would be desirable, what would fit in within the university landscape. And you get to the point where actually how much it costs. And this is why the idea came, what if we somebody, but I, I just have to find a person, which I haven't been able to create a phone app where we can yeah. actually virtually mapping the, uh, the, the campus and I could upload all the information and regularly updating. So you just walk with your phone and you would see that actually this is a white flower meadow and all the info would come. I just need to find somebody. And this is, I think it's very difficult because there are, there are, all, there, are there is many students who are very clever and they, we have the course where actually they do these type of things. It's just, yeah. It's, it's very tough to, to make these connections, especially with academics, when uh, they, they are almost living in their own small bubbles. I just, but no, I think they, this, this, this is why, but, but again, we still need some sort of signage, I think, in my view, to highlight, because if, if somebody doesn't, he never seen a, a raspberry or a gooseberry mm -hmm. plant before, then how would the person know? And, yeah, yeah no, it is. I was just going to say, we, uh, I mean, we've been fortunate to work with our campus architecture office because they have standards for all the signs on campus, you know, the same font, the same look, etc. So we've been able to work with them 
over time we get some good signs in place and I can I can share this came out of that student project on the edible gardens the um, other thing that we've been thinking a lot about especially with COVID is engaging students to create educational short educational videos about yep. different features on campus and then that could be you know you could weave that into some sort yep. of app um, or you could just have you know, post it says learn more about this, you know, some way of letting students yeah. know they can find out more by going to to a YouTube video or something like that. Yeah, I hate to cut this discussion short, but there's <laughs> time it is 2.30 uh, or whatever time it is in your time. <laughs> but thank nice. you so much, Demi, for a wonderful presentation and really exciting discussion. Uh, at this time, I'm going to stop recording.